So today I'm here with Simon Rinney and I was really excited to speak to Simon because, well, first of all, he's a fellow podcaster and I've been following him now for, for a few days as well. And he has some really, really fascinating conversations now, but obviously before he started to have these fascinating conversations, which we'll go into in a minute, he was doing a completely different job and gave all of that up to to do what he's doing now. So welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Simon, do you want to tell us what you were doing before you made your big career change? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and, and chat about career changes. The podcasting, the social media, all that stuff came along with the career change. But before I do what I do now, which is men's therapy, so I'm a social worker and I have my own private practice, I was in a 15-year public service career, actually, so a white-collar job, something that I just fell into after university, after my bachelor's degree. Didn't really know why I applied, but it was pretty much the only thing that came up on Yahoo at the time. I don't think Google was around back then. So um, genuinely, so, just to, to, I, I mean, I really have to ask, yeah. are you being very serious about that that's how your career absolutely started. so okay. 2006 is when I finished my bachelor's degree mm -hmm. and you know I, I had this idea of getting into a an office job even even selecting that bachelor's degree was a bit of a, a random thing in itself um, but yeah I remember getting towards the end of the degree and going okay what does a social scientist do with a major in anthropologist in anthropology should I say and literally the only thing that came up was graduate programs in the public service. And so <laughs> I applied for a couple that kind of looked okay. None of them really lit me up. I just applied and I happened to get one, which, yeah, created this 15-year career in the public service in all sorts of different government agencies. Mm -hmm. um, but if I was having my time again, I would do things a lot differently. But I guess that's the the, the benefit of hindsight. Yes. Did you have people around you that were like, Simon, you should definitely be going into government or were you sort of left to your own devices in terms of choosing your career path? Left to my own devices. No one really had a way to guide me. Um, mm -hmm. My dad had worked in the council, the local council for all of his life. My mum was a cleaner. So like I didn't really want to go down those two career paths. And so I kind of just stumbled across it myself by just yeah jumping online and trying to find out what a social scientist does yeah I think a lot of people are actually going to be a little bit relieved to hear you say that because I think <laughs> a lot of us do just fall into jobs and and then you know it's a cliche for a reason a lot of people end up sort of in midlife and and stop and go mm. hang on how how the heck have I ended up here this isn't where I wanted to be so Absolutely. What, yeah. is that kind of what happened for you or what, what was it definitely that? happened for me but I guess to to understand why I'm as a social worker now as well so I've got a, a long history of mental illness um, from 8 to 28 undiagnosed and I remember getting towards the end of high school and this is a period as well where we didn't talk about mental health so this was all internalized nobody knew I had mental health conditions I didn't know I had a mental health condition because I hadn't been diagnosed I remember coming towards the end of high school saying to myself what am I going to do after high school? There was a very low percentage of people that went to university from my school. It was very a disadvantaged school and from a dis disadvantaged area. Somehow I failed year 12 and I thought, no, I don't want to just end up at working at McDonald's or working in a trade or, or something like that. I actually want something better for myself. And I want to go and work with people like me. I didn't have the words to say, I want to go and work in the mental health sector. I just didn't know that existed. And I'm, but I did remember coming across in in a university book, like what what subjects you can go. Back then, it was like a big phone book size thing of, of degrees, and and I stumbled across psychology. I'm like, oh, mate, that sounds like they work with mental health or, or people like me. Um, so I repeated year twelve. So we did year, I did year thirteen to get enough points to get into university, and somehow I got in. I think I got a few bonus points because I went to a disadvantaged school as well. So that worked in my favour. And, but then second year, I I had signed up for a psychology, uh, I guess, major in social science. Second year, I dropped out because I couldn't work out the statistics subjects that were associated with psychology. So dropped out, that's how I transitioned into anthropology and then kind of stumbled my way. What does an anthropologist do? Well, the only thing that came up was government. Fast forward to about six or seven years into my career, I'm just like this 
these are some interesting jobs that I'm doing. And I'd had some interesting jobs, but it just never lit me up. And by the time I'd come to that realization, I'd been diagnosed. I knew what mental health was. And I go, okay, eventually I'm going to work in that space. Fast forward a couple more years. I didn't do anything on it, but a couple more years, I had got so sick of being in this public service role that wasn't lighting me up, that wasn't having me jump out of bed at 5.30 in the morning to do a podcast and talk about my role in the public service. And I'm like, nah, this is the time. I'm like, I've got to do something. My brain's dead. Um, and so that's when I started exploring getting into the mental health space. So it's really interesting to hear you say, it, you know, I never really did anything that lit me up. That sort of suggests that you had the realisation that a job could or, in fact, should light you up. Where did that come from? Because a lot of people just do continue to go through the motions and think, well, work isn't meant to be fun. It's meant to be serious. It's meant, you know, it's just a means of putting food on the table, a roof over my head. What was it that made you think I should be lit yeah. up? A few things, I guess. During that public service career, I had some really interesting roles. So I'd worked in things like sports anti-doping, which not many people get to do, which is really exciting. I could talk about sport all day. Australia's a sports mad yeah. country and I love my sport. I worked in border force. So I'd, I was working in compliance roles and, and intelligence roles. I was working in sexy jobs. But yeah, after a while, the, the, the shine rubbed off. And I think one of the key factors for me was We'd moved from Canberra, which is the, the hub of the public service here in Australia, and we moved interstate a few times, and we ended up in places that were better for lifestyle, but not great for career progression. So I was feeling like I was stuck on the like the second or third rung of the ladder. I really wanted to climb, but it, there was just no opportunities. And then the workplace was becoming more and more robotic. It was less and less about talking to people and being out in community and more about just numbers, how many numbers can you do each day because we've got um, key performance indicators to meet, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and that just became a grind. And then I just, I think I was probably burning out as well. Like I really wanted to climb the ladder, didn't know how to do it. I was seeing other people getting promoted, and but I was just as skilled as them. And so there was just a lot of internal me just getting down. And I think part of what I started to see outside of that was you know, a bit of a boom in social media, other people living their best lives and, and, and wanting more and wanting to keep up with the Joneses, but also me going to therapy and, and seeing what it was like to sit on a therapy couch and, and see all these people with degrees and, and just helping me to work through whatever challenges I'm working through. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that got me a little bit excited. I'm like, maybe I should be doing stuff like this. I've always wanted to do stuff like this. Then it was just about trying to figure out how we actually go about transitioning a career. Um, and interesting in the career transitions, everyone says, oh, you can just use transferable uh, skill sets. Very hard to do. I'm not sure why it was. I, I applied for so many jobs. I've applied for jobs that weren't even in mental health. They just were out of the public service and I either got no response or you're overqualified. I'm like, well, well how could you say that? I, I I don't care if I'm overqualified. I just want a different job. I want to try and change careers. I want to do something different, try and spark this excitement in me. It ultimately led to me just having to go back to study because that was the only way I could take my current skill sets, develop more skill sets, and then make that career transition. There was a lot to consider. Like it was, how can I, you know, could I get work to help, you know, fund that? Or, you know, or could I get work to give me time off to work to to study? How am I going to negotiate, you know, navigate going back to university, doing a second degree? Because, you know, I had to find time to study. I had to find a university to study at and, and a course that I liked. Um, just happens to be that my local university had a course that I liked. I had to navigate young families so we had a little boy I think it was about one at the time um, when I started studying so I had to navigate that with my wife how who was going to manage that how we were going to manage family life when was I going to find time to study because also I was working two hours away from where I lived so there's a lot of time for me sitting on trains and, and stuff like that so there's a lot to consider and then as I progressed through the study it was also about how can I continue the momentum through that? Because I eventually did burn out in 2020, so halfway through the degree. Um, and how can I get that energy just to finish off that degree and and all that type of stuff? And, and my degree also had 
two lots of 500 hour placements that I had to try and figure out how to get time off of work to go and work somewhere else for three or four months to get the the degree. And, and I was luckily that I had that long public service career to do that because I had lots of annual leave that I could to tap into. And in fact, my second lot of placement was my long service leave. So I never got to go away on a cool holiday. It was going to work at some other employer for free. And in fact, I had to pay for it for the privilege. Um, so yeah, I use a lot of those, I guess, perks from the public service just to, to get through really. Yeah. So you'd started studying while you were still working for the public sector. Yeah, um, I had to because we, you know, we had a mortgage, we had a, a little bub, um, you know, Gussie was only one. Um, I couldn't afford just to take time off and, and, and go study. If I did, I could have done that in two years as a postgraduate degree. Um, but I had to take the long route and do it part time. So it was a four year process for me just to get through to the end of study. Yeah. So what was it that you studied? Yeah, so when I was deciding which uh, course to do, it wasn't necessarily mental health. My actually sister-in-law was doing occupational therapy and every now and then she'd send me an essay to review to, for her just so I can, and I'm like, oh, this is a really interesting, you know, what you're talking about. So I went to my local uni and I said, I want a career change. Thinking mental health, I was actually thinking counselling, but maybe uh, occupational therapy. And so we walked, worked through it and both degrees required a lot of more study to get into. And at the same time, I was also thinking, I don't want to be stuck in a, in a job where I have to do the same thing every single day. And so the career counsellor that I went and spoke to at the university said, what about social work? Have you ever heard of that? And I said, no, I've never heard of social work. So we walked through social work and what stood out was it was a short degree. So it was only two years post-grad which ended up being four years part-time, but it was also gave me a lot of creative freedom. So I could be working in child protection or I could work in mental health or I can go work in a hospital or go do policy work or community development. So there was lots of opportunities to explore different things if I got bored because I was a bit worried about getting stuck in a new career and getting bored again. And so that, that stood out for me and I, I ended up picking social work and, um, subsequently when I did transition my careers designed a therapy practice that aligned with that creativity as well awesome so I mean you, you're gonna have to tell us exactly what you're doing now then having made the transition yeah absolutely so I always wanted to work in mental health uh, initially those first decade I didn't know what that was um, eventually landed on wanting to be a therapist and I wanted to be a therapist for men just given my history of mental health and not having a man or a positive male role model to look up to or to speak about my mental health, I kind of wanted to be the guy that I never had. And so um, went started down that route and wanted to be on my own business as well. I thought I'd worked for other, you know, in the public service for so long and I just wanted to make my own decisions and have my own creative freedom and, and time freedom and just do things differently. And so I started a private practice. I'd never had a business before. I had did, did 12 weeks in a private practice through my placement. So that was the only real ex like business experience I had doing that kind of work outside of being a client of the mental health system and being the guy that comes and sits on the couch. Um, and so that's what I wanted to do. And that's essentially what I did and, and created this thing out of nothing, um, but also created it differently. So I didn't want to sit in a clinic all day. I actually created it so that I go and visit guys in the community or I pick them up, we go for a drive or we go do you know, beach walking and we do our therapy sessions just on the move. We're out of a clinic, we're in nature and um, I really love it because every day is so different. Yeah, how nice for you to be able to get outside as well. And actually the mm. whole walking and talking thing, I don't know, there's probably a load of research around it, but it just seems to be a really powerful thing. Especially yeah, I, th I think particularly nature. for guys yeah. and for guys as well, like guys don't want to come into a therapy clinic. It's very mm -hmm. stigmatizing. Guys really struggle to talk about mental health. So if we can break down all those walls and just do it in our natural environment, it does go a long way to helping them open up a lot sooner as well. I mean, obviously we've had this huge movement towards people being much more open about mental health and struggling with mental health. And thank goodness the stigma has reduced massively over the last few years. With regards to men, it still seems to be a bit of a taboo subject. It still seems to be 
um, I was listening to an interview with you and it really, it made me feel really sad and then really happy that you're doing something about it. But you told this story, which I'm going to ask you to retell of when you were a child and you saw somebody in your playground crying and what your response mm. was to that. Do you mind talking us through that? Yeah, I, I feel really, <clears throat> I feel a lot of shame thinking about this story these days, but at the time, you know, I grew up in the 80s, 90s, noughties of northern suburbs of Adelaide in South Australia, and it was very working class. It was don't talk about your feelings, particularly for boys. You've got to suck it up. You've got to be hard. You've got to drink concrete and be tough. You know, that's that's the mantra that was around. That mantra is still around in a lot of, you know, a lot of places around the world. And I remember I bought into that. I That's all I knew. So if I was to shed a tear and I would be, you know, maybe ridiculed or my, my dad might say, oh, stop crying. Don't be, don't be so, so wussy or, or something like that. Or don't be so soft. Or if it happened on the football field, the same thing would happen, you know? And so I learned very quickly to bottle things up. And that's why I didn't talk about my mental health. Can you know, I just ask happened. you, where do yeah. you think that comes from? Like, where's the source of this belief mm. that men shouldn't show emotion? I think it's, it's it's how we're socially constructed. So I talk about this a lot. It's when when a, a baby comes out, yeah, a boy comes out, it's a blue T-shirt. A girl comes out, it's a pink T-shirt. And we value in boys them being tough, they're being, you know, a bit of a troublemakers. Like we, we encourage this for some reason from a society level. We encourage our girls to be soft and and, and open and, and and loving and all this type of stuff. So it's a bit of the, almost the, the hunter nurturer type of mindset that we've had since, you know, essentially cavemen. Um, and so that's continued and it, it's a social, I guess, construction of what it means to be a boy and a girl. And it's interesting though, because if you were to put a blue t-shirt on a boy, you know, society would just go, oh, she's just wearing a blue t-shirt. You know, maybe she's a bit of a tomboy and they laugh it off. But if you were to put a pink t-shirt on a boy, questions would be asked. What's wrong with him? Is he gay? Is he, why are you doing this? Why are you going against the norm? And so it's very much of a, from a, from a society level, almost tabooed from, for guys to, or boys to be put in any sort of light that isn't tough, strong, carry on regardless. So there's that element. And then there's also, I guess, how it's re defined in things like the media so 80s 90s 90s i lived in a household with three brothers two older brothers and they would have what's on tv and it would be die hard the terminator rambo big macho alpha male um heroes that would walk through walls of fire would be stabbed would be shot all these types of things and they would save the day. So we're seeing it on TV. I guess the modern day examples, whatever you see on, on social media and so forth. And so there's that element as well that, that continues to reinforce it. You know, I talked about Sports Mad Australia and, and playing football. So I played Aussie Rules football. So it is a very testosterone driven game. If you were to show any sign of weakness, you would be targeted for the next big hit. So again, on the sports field, it was it was reinforced as well. And I think this kind of mindset has carried on through generations. And uh, we think about you know, the world wars and, the, and people had to be tough. They had to be strong. They had to, to push through because they had really valid reasons in terms of survival. If, if they weren't going to be tough, they might not survive. And so the challenge there is, is that we haven't had a world war since. I mean, I don't know what's happening at the moment. We're probably on the, the, the cusp of it, but it's going to look very different if it did happen again to what it did in between the twenties, thirties, forties, you know, and so these kind of things from intergenerations keep coming through. And, and I bought into that with my mate and, and I saw him crying and I said, mate, first of all, I don't even think I said, what's wrong? I said, mate, why are you crying? You've got to stop crying. And he's like, why? I said, well, because we're not meant to cry. Boys aren't meant to cry. It's, we shouldn't do this type of thing. And, he, and, and you I love what he totally said. totally meant that at the time too, Absolutely. Right? And and I think I was projecting my myself onto him. If people were to see me crying, that's what I would have been told. Yeah. And I love what he said in response. He said, Simon, I can cry if I want to. And that really shook something in me. I'm, and I'm like, I think I was taken aback a bit. I was, I was like, what, what, what? You, you're not listening to me? What's going on? I think I said it a few times. And then he ultimately pushed me away. And, and then he went on his way. I went on my way. But we stayed, you know, good mates. That planted a seed in me that I never talked about until I started sharing my story in 2020. And, and I think that's, that's also him saying that, 
has helped me pursue this this thing that I have now, this this passion I have now for men's mental health and starting to inspire men to talk about their stuff because so many of us have bottled it up for, for me, it was two decades, if not longer. And so many guys that I work with in my clinic have done the same. They're, they're coming to therapy for the first time, but also for them to recognize that, but also to support their, their boys particularly and their girls, but their boys particularly to start younger, start sharing their stories and, and, and their emotions and feelings and not be afraid to, to cry in front of each other. I mean, I make a very conscious effort. If I'm sad and, and something's wrong, I won't hide away from my kids and cry. I might be crying on the bed or on the couch for whatever reason. And I love how they come up to me and say, daddy, are you okay? And I will talk about it a little so bit sweet. with them. And, um, but I never had that. And I think I was doing that to, to my, my friend in the school. Yeah. I trying to tell him to suck it up. And I bought into this social construct of what it means to be a boy and then ultimately a man too well it's interesting because did you say you were 10 years old when this happened about that time yeah I was in the yeah. schoolyard and and I still remember the conversation very vividly I don't yeah. remember much of my life but yeah. that, that well, conversation the, this is, yeah, yeah the, and this is exactly the point I was going to make that you know loads of stuff happens to us when we're kids we have like a hundred million conversations a day and yet this is a conversation that really has stuck in your mind. So it's very interesting, isn't it, that all these years later, it's the subject of conversation and it's still coming mm. up. And I mean, you said oh, it's not a story I'm proud of, but you've turned that story on its head and you're using it for good now. So I think it's OK to not feel ashamed of that story now. You were 10. You'd been taught yeah. to act in a certain way and... And obviously, exactly like you said, it planted that seed for you to actually start playing with and start shifting and changing the narrative around it, which is actually pretty cool. Yeah, I guess what you've, you've touched on something there is is using my pain for my purpose now, which is something for a long time I was a survivor and I was in survival mindset. I was the victim, the world against me. But since burning out in 2020, so that's an, an extra part of my story, I've really taken off that mask and going, you know what, I'm sick of living this double life or this lie because on the outside, I'd be very strong and tough and had it all together. But on the inside, I was a shell of a person. I was so messed up and taking off that mask and saying, here, here I am. Well, this is it. And I'm going to start talking about this type of stuff. Every time I have conversations and podcasts or in therapy clinics or, you know, sessions with my clients or also with my therapist or with my wife, my GP, extra little things pop up and, and, I use those as the fuel for what I'm doing and the reason I'm doing this. And, and I have a very clear vision in my head of who I'm doing it for. And it's my, my son, essentially. I, he always pops in my head when I think about why am I doing this? You know, why am I up at 5.30 in the morning talking about men's mental health with someone across the world? A, I love it. And I'm a bit of a podcast addict, my wife would say. We actually had this conversation last night. But then I, my son's image comes into my mind. He is seven this year. I, my mental health story started at eight years old. So he's got another year and I'm desperately want him to not go through what I went through. He might have mental health challenges and that's okay, but I want him to know that he can talk to dad because dad's been there and done it and dad's got a way out. And and that's, you, we can turn that pain into our purpose and our passion and our fuel. And that's, that's really what lights me up these days is using all those stories and, and memories to design something that, suits guys down to a T. It's not something that they go into a clinic and they talk to someone with just book smarts. I want them to feel like they've got someone with the street smarts as well when it comes to mental health. And somebody who's been there and done that and experienced it. And it's, I mean, it, you can speak from a place of empathy so much more than, you know, I, I just know the theory of how it feels to not yeah. be able to get out of bed or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and yeah. I think just going back to your son, he probably has no idea right now what you're doing, but one day he's going to be so ridiculously proud of you. How cool is that? I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, we, we've we got the big Mindful Men stuff. That's the business. And and I wear every day Mindful Men t-shirts as a bit of a passive marketing. Uh, people just laugh at me. Like even when I'm at home, I'll be wearing Mindful Men stuff, but they <laughs> they want Mindful Men t-shirts. So my daughter, so she had a little pink one and my son's got a little blue one and they wear it. My son's ripped a hole in his, so now I've got to buy another one. 
but they they love it and they get in the Mindful Men Ute. So I've got this big car with Mindful Men stickers all over it. So that they know kind of what I'm doing. Maybe this is part of a legacy and maybe I'll pass it on to him one day. But if he doesn't want to do that, that's okay as well. Um, but yeah, they see what I'm doing and, I, and I'm loving sharing this journey with them because uh, when I grew up, like we went along to to dad doing extra jobs or mum doing extra jobs, but we never really lived and breathed the businesses. So this is something that we we share as a family. And even my wife, you know, in the next couple of months, she's going to create a transition and come into the business and start helping me. So um, it's going to be a big exciting. family thing. It is really exciting. Um, I'm really excited for her because she she had a similar story. So she had the public service story as well. Didn't really, she just landed in a job and stuck with it for 15 years. And then she's tried private work and the culture shift there is really toxic at the moment. And so um, she's looking forward to, we've got a few things to do first, but she's looking forward to making some steps and, and coming out and, and joining me in Mindful Men. So that's yeah, wow. going to be a really cool family business. Yeah, that's really awesome. Um <laughs> You talked about your parents earlier and the fact that you grew up in a household that was, well, there were, what, you, your three brothers, your dad, so four men, one woman, any sisters? Yeah, five, oh, five so five men with my dad, mum, mum did have a, a, a girl, but she passed away a year before oh, I was born. Oh, so I'm I, sorry to hear that. But I said I was the attempt to get another girl and then two more boys popped out. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, very masculine household. I do feel sorry for my mum because she had to bear watching cricket in the summer, watching footy in the winter and yeah, just being around boy stuff. But I think she loves having boys. So, so do you mind me asking, you said that it was sort of frowned upon for boys to show any kind of feeling and now you're doing, you know, 24 seven talking about men's feelings. <laughs> How does your family feel about that? This is a, an interesting subject. So my side of the family, they don't talk about it still, so you know, they don't really, mum asks, how's the business going? And and maybe one of my brothers might go, how's the business going? But they don't go into nitty gritty and detail. I doubt they're listening to the podcast that I do every week. Um, and, and so like, I've never spoken to dad about it either. And it's just one of those things, but my wife side. Does wife's he think is, you do? Does he know? He knows that I'm, I've got a business and I do, I'm a therapist or something like that, but Okay. It's, I think he's still in a generation where his generation just didn't talk. They don't talk. He, he, he's, he's sitting at home, I think, waiting for the end of his days. It's, it's essentially how I look at him and which is really sad. And, mm. and we try to get him to open up, but he's very much a, a shutdown person. So mm. maybe he's got some mental health as, as issues going on. He won't, he would he probably would never admit it to anybody. Um. So there's that element, but what I see on the opposite side of my family, so my wife's side of the family, is when I came into that family, very similar. They didn't talk about mental health, at least I never saw it, but it was around the time I got diagnosed as well. And so I think them seeing me get diagnosed and starting that therapy process, I think 11 years ago now, that prompted, I think, one of her sisters to to start talking about her mental health and then that had a bit of a ripple effect. So now the they, mental health is discussions in my wife's side of the family is actually become more prominent as well. So I'm not sure if it's because of my story, but maybe I've had some sort of influence in, in them talking about mental health and, and going and seeing. I think you seeing... should take the credit regardless. <laughs> I'll take the credit, but going and seeing therapists or getting on medications and it not being a taboo subject anymore. So that's something that, I have a little bit of pride with, yeah, I'll take the credit while we're, I'm on this show. Um, but at the same time, it could be a whole range of things, but I think it just coincided with my story and, and my journey as well, which has been really nice to see. Do you mind talking about how your mental health is now? Yeah, it's a roller coaster. <laughs> so, so I've lived with mental health conditions from eight, I'm 40 now, Um it's it is certainly a roller coaster. Someone also with a small business, so I get a lot of anxiety and stress and, and imposter syndrome with the, the small business. And am I enough? Am I good enough? Am I, where's the next clients coming from? All that kind of stuff happens these days. I don't tend to get depressed as much. My mental illness, most of my mental illness, is around actually obsessive compulsive disorder and, and perfectionism and 
that really drives how I'm going. So if I'm managing well with my eat, sleep, you know, with exercise, all those types of self-care activities, connection is a big one, then that kind of, you know, slows down, it it quiets the mind and, and all that type of stuff. One of the big changes in my mental health, you know, in the last 12 months was getting sober at 40. So for wow. 25 years, I used alcohol as a way to slow my mind and and to feel normal and to numb everything. But I got sober at 40 and I've had so much more energy since then and making some new connections with guys that are around not the superficial stuff that most guys would do, talk about like going to the pub and talking about girls, footy and, and work. It was actually finding guys that we can talk about things a bit deeper, like who are we as guys and, you know, um, doing healthier things like I've got a surf crew now we go surfing on a Wednesday and have a coffee afterwards and just changing the the dynamics of what it, we're used to growing up in, and socializing as men so I'm on a very much of a healing journey and since lit, dropping alcohol um, a lot of other things have fallen into place I'm able to manage my mental health a lot easier but I'm also a therapist in therapy. So I know when things are really spiking out of control, I'll just call my therapist and, and book myself in because I don't, well, I'm sick of hiding it and, and I'm used to now talking about it so much that I've got my strategies if I need to. But yeah, it is much better than it used to be. My my teens to my 20s, my early 30s, it was yeah mayhem in my brain. This is possibly a really ignorant question. So feel free to say that's a stupid question. <laughs> is there a point at which your mental health will just be hunky-dory or is it something that you think you're going to have to work on until the day you die? Yeah, I think it's, it's, I think we all have mental health. So for some people they can really manage it. It doesn't really phase them, but for other people, they really do need support. And I think I fall into the latter. Um, but I'm at a point where I'm not having to be in therapy regularly. Like I can be in for maybe a six week stint or a 12 week stint or, and, and get through whatever challenge it is, but then it, it tapers off and I can do six to nine to 12 months and not have to go back to therapy. As long as I'm taking my medication every day, which I do doing my self care, as I said, every day, which I do being in business as well as a social worker, I've got an external supervisor. So I meet with them once a month to talk about social work and small business and help keep me on track there. But I think other, other supports come in too as well. So I have business coach, I have, my wife, who you know is is an amazing support. I reach out to people when I need it because I know that I can't do it all myself. And if I try to do it all myself, I burn out, and I don't want to burn out again. And so, I've got all these factors in. But I also have exit plans as well as a small business. I like I know that I don't want to talk about mental health forever. I love talking about it, but there will come a point in time, maybe in ten or fifteen years, where. I want to do something different. I want to experience something different. So there will come a time where I shut up books and I stop talking and all that type of stuff. But that's part of business and that's part of life as well. So it is good. It, it, it'll it be around for as long as it's around. And I always say to people when in a mental health journey, one person's journey might be a month long, another person's might be a lifetime long. And so it'll finish when it finishes, hopefully sooner rather than later, but I'm not yeah, holding on to hope that it's going to be healed next year or or in five years or in 10 years it'll just happen when it happens yeah well it's an interesting thing isn't it being a human being hmm. you um, yeah. you get thrown curveballs and you just have to learn to navigate different situations throughout your life I think you're and I don't think anybody's immune in fact no. you just you know talking about lifestyle and I'm I'm somebody that eats relatively healthy I'm quite conscious of what I eat I love a donut, don't get me wrong, but, I, but you know, it's, it's all about the balance and, um, and I love being outside in nature and going to the gym and listening to my podcast and getting a good night's sleep. All of these things I know ensure that, and meditation ensure that I've got, that I feel really quite good. Hmm. And then the last two weeks, two or three weeks, my daughter was sick for two whole weeks. So she was at home, which then stopped me going out and doing the things that I normally do. And then I felt unwell, as in I, I think I caught a strain of whatever she had. And at the weekend, it properly hit me where I was like, I feel sad about absolutely every aspect of my life. And I can't get motivated. And oh my goodness, everything I'm doing is on the work front is awful. Like you go into this really quite crazy place. And I guess I've been fortunate that I haven't 
had too many mental health struggles in my life, but I can totally see how that could lead to a downward spiral very, very quickly. Because I was like, Mm. this is like an out of control feeling. And I don't normally feel like this. And it's very disconcerting. And thankfully, this week and last week, I've managed to get back into my routine. But it just shows Mm. you, I think, how much your environment, the activities you spend your time doing, the food you eat, the sleep you get, all of that makes such a... I mean, I'm preaching to the converted, right? I'm just, I'm looking at you for confirmation (laughs) that I'm not just making this stuff up. (laughs) No, no. You're saying, you're right on it. Self-care routines are hugely important. It's not a... Historically, for me, it used to be a every now and then thing, but I've worked out it has to be a regular thing. And, and we've had similar, like at the start of this year, we had, I had COVID, my wife had COVID, my daughter had COVID, you know, I couldn't get exercise and my wife had to go away for a funeral. So I was on dad duty, so I couldn't go do my surf crew on a Wednesday. And and you do, you you, you fall into a pit of despair, but yeah. I think as long as you get back up and, and brush yourself off and get back into your routine, then things start to fall in place again as well. And it's even, I guess, more challenging if you've got a small business like I do, like because you, you forgo income and, and you know, also where's the next referrals coming for. So you're always trying to think ahead as, as well as um, being in the present. So there's lots of little elements, but as you said, you we're all human. And so I look at it like a, a roller coaster of humanity. And, and one, one day we're up, other days we're down. Yeah. Other days we're ecstatic. Other days we feel we're about to, you know, face plant into the ground and spew all over ourselves. So it is, it's life. But as long as we have, I guess, the right supports and the right self care systems in place, then we can we can navigate it. And it's not something that we have to hide away from anymore. It's, I think, COVID gave us the license to talk about all this stuff and to make you know career changes and and pivot points in life as well. And I think more and more people are realizing that. They don't have to be stuck in that nine to five and doing the same old, same old. They can branch out and do absolutely anything in the world and, and still survive and, and get through it and and be happier as well. So as long as you have those systems and structures in place um, or reach out for, for new systems and structures, reach out for new supports, um, we can navigate it and, and come out the other side, you know, relatively intact. Maybe our hair's out of place. <laughs> we've lost a few hairs or gone gray or, you know, put a few extra kgs on or whatever it is, um, but we can get through it. We're still here. Yes. In terms of getting men to open up and talk about the issues that they're facing, what's the magic one thing here? Like what what should we all be doing to encourage men to open up? Yeah, I think having conversations just like this is is a great starting point. Um, guys, I we like we get inspired by other people and, and we watch other people do things first before we do it, in most cases. Um, and so seeing people talk about men's mental health is is just the starting point and what i th- i believe is that the more we talk about it the more we normalize it as well so we normalize our mental health as much as our physical health and any guys listening you know you might have hurt your hamstring or hurt an arm or whatever you you wouldn't hesitate to go to the doctor and and get it fixed it's the same with your mental health your brain is part of your body and in fact your brain regulates everything in, in your body you, your thoughts your feelings your your decision making is and all that type of stuff so if we can just nurture that like a mechanic would a car or like a physio might do for our you know our leg or arm then we'll be better for it and we can make better decisions we can manage our well-being better um, so just starting these conversations having these conversations sharing them with somebody that you know um, is the great great starting point the the challenge then is taking the next step. And so it's finding the right people to talk to as well. So if you're a guy <clears throat> and you're struggling with your mental health, it could be like, do you have a good friend who has a good head on his shoulders? Who's not going to dismiss you that you can talk to about what's going on or a partner or a family member. If you don't have any of those things, uh, maybe it's your doctor, your GP. That's where I start. And that's where a lot of people start because they have the connections in, they know what to do. Can you get a referral to a psychologist psychiatrist, a counsellor, a social worker, et cetera. But you don't have to go through that system as well. I have clients that just pay me privately. So they just Google me, not Yahoo anymore, but they Google me and, and they find, oh, men's mental health. And this dude has got his own podcast and, and his YouTube channel and all that stuff. And if they can hear us talk about it, then that, that also breaks down the barrier. They go, oh, who's this Simon dude talking about mental health? Oh, he talks about it all the time and quite easily. Maybe I'll tie it in with him because he struggled with alcohol or he's struggled with depression or OCD or burnout. And that's kind of what I'm going through as well. So 
that shared lived experience goes a huge way. But often I'm having this phone call every single week with with a, a partner, a wife, you know, a, a daughter, a mum. Usually I get a lot of women calling me on the, in the therapy clinic saying, I've got a guy, he needs help. How do I get him into therapy? And I say, well, you can't get him into therapy. Just plant these seeds, these conversations, a podcast, a book, you know, point him in the right direction. And eventually he'll have his own light bulb moment where he goes, you know what? Everybody else is right. I've been deflecting this issue. I need to go get help. And and that's when the beauty comes. Unfortunately, so many guys don't get to that stage as well. And we'll I won't bother you with the, the statistics on, on, on self-harm and stuff like that. But yeah, there's too many guys that don't get to that stage. Yeah, they're not pretty stats. I've heard a few and they're not they're not particularly encouraging, but you know, thank goodness for people like you that are hopefully making that change and hopefully one day we'll be able to look back on this time and go, gosh, can you remember when men just wouldn't talk about it and just didn't know how to get out of feeling the way they did? Um, mm, yeah. I'm that, that will be to a that good day. day. Yeah, that will be. I mean, you're going to be unemployed, but I mean, in the grand <laughs> scheme of over. things, <laughs> let's call that a luxury problem. So yeah, it's a luxury problem. And in fact, maybe by then I'll be retired. So it'll be all good. <laughs> <laughs> a question that I ask all my guests is, what does success mean to you? And has the definition changed over the years? It's a really good question. I think for me, knowing what I do, like working with men every single day is is success in itself. Having guys come into therapy and then come back as well at success as a small business owner but also me being able to use that pain that I had for so long into purpose is huge success as well. Um, when I was making the career transition, I had a huge lot of imposter syndrome and I still have that today as a small business owner and a therapist, but knowing that I can share my story and people aren't afraid of hearing that story. In fact, they want to hear that story is a huge bit of success for me as well. And I guess then I look at future success. Maybe it's my son, being open with talking about his emotions and my daughter as well. I don't, I don't want to um, dismiss her and, and their friends and, and, and then, the, you know, their families when they grow up and have families as well. If I can leave a legacy of people just wanting to talk about stuff, that would be um, really successful as well. So yeah, just getting guys in, sharing my story. And then I guess leaving that legacy for my, my future kids and their families would be, um, well, not my future kids, they are my current kids, but <laughs> my current kids and their future families and their friends, that's what success looks like for me. I love that definition. What have you learned about yourself making the transition from where you were to where you are now in terms of your um, career? Yeah, that we can do it. Like it is hard sometimes. And there was a long road for me just to, you know, I had to go back to study for four years part-time, had to work full-time. So we had two kids in that time as well during the four year period. And I've learned that I really do need sufficient support structures in place to manage as well, both my mental health, but also business as well. So my wife has been a huge support. She has taken on the load of being the caregiver for the kids when I'm studying and, and allowing me to study and, and encouraging me to do all that type of stuff. But also, you know, transitioning as well, having the right supports to help me learn business too. Like, so my supervisor and from a social work perspective, but also having, I've had about three or four different business coaches over the time, trying to just encourage me to look at things differently or improve my mindset and, and all this type of stuff. So knowing that I need support structures in place and support people in place to to keep doing this and keep having that energy is really important. And I think that's, that's important for a lot of businesses out there, people going into business or even people going into new careers that might not be their business as well. Having the supports in place, coaches in, in life is, is a really cool, cool term, is really important because you think about when we grow up, we have our parents who might teach us stuff and then we have we go to school and we have teachers who are teaching us stuff and then we might play sports and we have coaches who are coaching us stuff or doing dance or art or whatever we're doing. We have people that are coaching and teaching us things as well. But when we turn 18 or 21, depending on where you are in the world and when you become an adult, all of that drops away. And so you, you don't really have people that are coaching you through life, egging you on, wanting you to be better and better and better. So I think we're in an age where life coaches are becoming really prominent. Business coaches are becoming really prominent because we need that coaching and support. We need to draw on other people's expertise to 
to thrive and not just survive and to um, strategize and think think differently, think outside the box. So that's something I've, I've certainly learned is the importance of those support structures that I need for my mental health from a therapy perspective, but also from a, a business and, and career transition perspective as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's so incredibly powerful to have people that are sort of cheerleading you from the sidelines and want the absolute best for you. Mm. Um, and you know, I was reflecting on this the other day, and I think pretty much every single guest I've had on this podcast so far has mentioned their life partner as like the number one important thing in in helping them make that career transition. So it's really interesting that you've brought that up as well. Um, if you could go back, what would you do differently? Anything? Um, I think if I could go back, I'd do the first, the right degree the first time. <laughs> so, but I didn't know what I didn't know. Like I, I ended up in this generalist social social science degree when I was in my bachelor's years, and it is what it is. So, um, if I was to go back now, I think picking a degree, for example, that was more aligned with my life stage and and probably more online. So I I chose the the university that I did my master's degree because it was local. I could go in person and all that type of stuff. But what I learned towards the end of my degree is that online learning is actually really useful as well. And I could potentially have fast tracked a few of my courses by doing some long distance ed with a different university and then using the recognized prior learning to essentially finish my degree earlier than four years. Because when you're working full time, you've got a family and you're studying, like everything is a grind. So the more quickly you can go through university or, or TAFE or whatever degree you're doing or, or certificate, um, the better, the quicker you can come outside of that as well. So that's one thing that I would look at as well. Um, but also not being so hard on myself and not not having to do everything perfectly as well. Being open to just learning and, and trying different things and not worrying about what other people might think just mm -hmm. sticking to my lane and, and doing things my way because this is ultimately why I got into business and, and not worrying about what the next business that looks like what I do what they're doing and f trying to copy them just staying in my line my lane and, and pursuing work or, or career in in a way that lights me up as well so I think they're two big takeaways that I would look at and and do things a little bit differently I love that you finally getting to use you you said right in the beginning I wanted to work with people like me that were having similar struggles to me and I yeah. love that you found a way to do that it's really awesome to hear and I hope that people who are listening to this who feel that, that sort of have that same desire that they actually take you as an inspiration and just go for it you know just mm. give it a go even if it's while you're still working full-time just give it a try. You've got nothing to lose. So uh, thank you for sharing your story. I'm really chuffed that you shared it with me today. This is your opportunity to give your podcast a plug because it's a brilliant yeah. podcast. And the more people and men in particular that, that listen to it, the better as far as I'm concerned. So go ahead and plug it. And I will also put yeah. it in the show notes. Yeah, so the Mindful Men podcast, it's a it's a weekly show where we have conversations just like this on a whole range of topics. So I've talked about my career transition. I think I talked about going back and being a mature age student, for example, mental health, men's health. We talk about finances, disability. I'm really passionate about disability as well. A whole range of weird and wonderful topics that we talk about. My son, Gus, came on as a five-year-old and and he's got a little episode and he's keen to come on as a seven, almost, or he's he's going to be seven next week. So seven-year-old. So I'm not sure. I said, mate, this time you've actually got to talk. Uh, podcasting is about talking. <laughs> <laughs> he just wanted to pull funny faces. Um, but yeah, it's it's a podcast that came from my career transition as well as me taking off that mask and just sharing my story and then hearing other people's stories. So I'm really passionate about the Mindful Men podcast, available pretty much wherever you get your, your podcasts these days. And it's just going to continue and continue to grow and grow. And, and yeah, if you if you love it, yeah, just tune in and share it with a friend that you, that might need to hear a story. And I think we all probably know at least one man who we know is struggling and who would really benefit. Mm. So yeah. do them a favor, find Simon's podcast and share it with them. And I just remembered one other thing I was going to ask you when you said about the mask. And when mm. you finally started to remove that and started to sort of share with the world that you had had these struggles, what was the response? Were people surprised? 
they were I don't think they were surprised. Um, but what it was, it, it was very welcoming. So taking off that mask, part of sharing the story was when I when I burnt out, I took four months off of work. And again, the benefit of public service, I had lots of sick leave, so I could do that. <laughs> but mm -hmm. when I came back, I just felt like the need to share the story because I knew other people in the workplace were burning out as well. It was a high pressure work environment. And luckily, and thankfully, my managers were said, yeah, let's talk about this. Let's, let's you know, do, do a half an hour presentation about burnout. At the end of that, I, I tacked on, oh, I'm also, I've also got these other mental health challenges as well. And I, and I, and I wanted to highlight that to show them that this is who me, this is my complete self. So if you're sitting next to me and I'm doing things in a certain way or I'm acting in a certain way, you know, this, this is part of the reason why. And so it felt freeing to do that. And people would come up and, and share, say, Simon, I've been feeling the same about burnout, or I didn't know about that about you, but I know someone else maybe with OCD and cause I talked about OCD and, and stuff like that, but the same response come from the podcast as well. People would contact me and say, Simon, thanks for sharing about this topic. Cause uh, it's, I've known someone who has experienced this or I've experienced it myself. So it is really warming to hear those comments and, and that feedback because for so long, we, we often just shy away from the conversations. And so it's nice to hear people talking about stuff. And all of a sudden when we share stories and we hear stories, we don't feel alone in the world as well. So that's, yeah, that, that's why I keep doing it. It just keeps lighting me up. Yeah. Love it. Well, keep going. You're changing the world one one man at a time, which is brilliant. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Really appreciate your time. And I wish you all the very, very best. Thank you.